All right, thank you for staying with the explainer. And Dr. Patrick Amoth is still with me, the Director General, Ministry of Health, and we're still continuing on this conversation of the crisis in the medical sector. Clinical officers have also down their tools on day two. Lab techs are also going on strike <laughs> on Wednesday. What is the solution for these two? Thank you, Trevor. I remember my closing remarks before we took a break regarding the output of clinical officers in this country. That number has increased more than fivefold. And again, clinical officers from the health labor market analysis is one cadre of health professionals who suffer from massive unemployment. For example, at the national level, we only have 207 clinical officers at the Ministry of Health headquarters. The counties employ another 6,700 thereabouts. Faith-based organizations and private facilities employ another 6,000. But we have close to 14,000 unemployed clinical officers. The honest discussion that we should be able to have now, is it prudent to continue in that path? Or we retrace our uh, path a little bit and see how we can be able to handle the clinical officers that are already in the ecosystem to progress them towards a certain career path. Do we continue? And remember clinical officers was a stopgap measure by our government then to be able to address the shortage of doctors. Now we have close to 2,500, 3,000 doctors who are unemployed in this country. Do we still want to continue producing clinical officers in those numbers? Or do we retool them, reskill them, so that they can be able to take a different path and then we reduce on the numbers because remember our clinical officers, most of them have no other pathway outside this country. They're only recognized here. Okay. So they have no exit clause in terms of their career progression. Either you are in Kenya or unless you are outside there, maybe you have taken a different career trajectory. Maybe somebody has gone into public health, somebody has done epidemiology, yeah. then more avenues happen. So that is one of the discussions that we need to have as a country. The clinical officers have come up with uh, about 10, 10 action points that they require us to be able to resolve. Yeah. One of them, of course, is their CBA, which has never been finalized uh, reg as regards the cost judgment of 2021. Number two is payment of their risk allowance from- They want that enhanced to 15,000. From the current 3,000 yes. in the fiscal space that we are operating in. They want that uh, clinical officers uh, promoted, redesignated, they want the clinical officers who are sacked by Kirinyaga County yeah. to be reinstated. I don't know how that affects Lamu County, Sierra County, for example. They want comprehensive medical cover, yeah. like, the, like the doctors want. And various counties, counties have reported to us that 32 counties have comprehensive medical cover for their staff. Of course, the national government has comprehensive medical cover for all public servants. So there are things that are unique to particular counties. Yeah. There are also things that require us to be able to address as a national government. Then there are also those things that are cross-cutting. And we are saying that the best course of action now with what we are dealing with is not to make a painful situation worse. Why don't we come together, sit down, agree to be able to progress this matter? Remember most of the resolutions, even in the previous strikes, yeah. many of the resolutions, many of the issues that we have resolved, have been resolved after people have resumed work or outside the strike period. During the strike period, it is very, very difficult yeah. to make progress because people come, people are not objective in their thought processes. But when there's peace, when people reason together like colleagues, yeah. we tend to progress the agenda forward. So what is the government position right now? That this can only be resolved when the doctors go back to work or what is it? Because it's day 20 of the strike. People no, that is not the government position. For example, you have talked about the clinical officers. Yeah. Of course, the proposal to be able to increase the risk allowance from 3,000 to 15,000, that is why Kenyans in their rightful minds decided to create the commission called Salaries and Remuneration Commission. We'll be able to write to Salaries and uh, SRC for guidance because they're the body mandated by the constitution to give us the guidance. If they tell us that this is, uh, this is possible, we will be able to approach Treasury to be able to provide the resources so that yeah. it can be able to resolve the matter. So what is the end game? Because there seems to be hard line on both sides. The doctors are saying one thing, the government is saying another thing. Trevor, remember tomorrow all the parties are in court. 
and uh, the parties are supposed to file submissions in court tomorrow to be able to ensure that uh, we have complied with the directives of uh, the Honorable Judge. That notwithstanding, we have continued, even now the clinical officers are on the streets. Today, in the morning, the principal secretary chaired a meeting with the officials of KUKO from 7 o'clock to 11 a.m. in the morning. Therefore, the ministry and the government is willing to be able to discuss anything. And also, the whole of national approach is, not, is probably taking this thing to a higher level, that there are certain things that cannot just be handled at the Ministry of Health alone. And therefore, we take it to the whole of national approach, chaired by the head of public service, so that we can be able to bring other critical stakeholders, including the Ministry of Education. For example, Trevor, now, if you look at the numbers of the interns, we have 85 internship training centers for the doctors and another 10 for, for the dentists. And these positions can be able to accommodate 1,100 thereabouts of these interns. But we don't have visibility in terms of the production. As a ministry through our regulatory agency, Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Council, we cannot go to Moi University or Nairobi University to be able to inspect the training institution to ensure that it meets the quality that we deserve as Kenyans. Okay. How can that happen? That everybody, and because people have seen that the health sector is a very vibrant sector, yeah. every Dick, Tom, and Harry wants now to start medical co colleges to be able to churn out, churn out, churn out graduates without taking into perspective the quality that we deserve. Okay. That is a conversation that we cannot just put under the carpet. We must have our own dis discussion. We must have visibility in the production pipeline, how they come into the sector, how they are absorbed, how they are distributed, how they are retained, how they migrate outside if they want to. Okay. So that we can be able to have a health sector that will respond to the needs of the Kenyan people for the next 50 years, 100 years to come. Okay. D Davji, who is fooling who here? Because the yeah. gov who is fooling who, Davji? I think the government is actually fooling Kenyans. And even from what Dr. Moth is putting up, it's more of a double speak. Uh, because first of all, he says that the, for the clinical officers, they're waiting to see whether SRC will approve the 15,000 so for them to pay. But here we have a case with points where SRC has approved payment of the medical intern doctors, and today they're sending the name to medical students. And then they're writing to SRC with the recommendation that they want. They did not sort the, 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 the SRC to evaluation. This is an aspect of double speak. Again, in this issue of uh, too many doctors that are graduating in the country. It's also a fallacy. It's a fallacious argument. Because we know, and he has put it out very clearly, we need more than 50,000 doctors to make the average recommendation of 1 to 1,000. We have about 2,500 employees in such a sector where there's a shortage. So it means there's no priority for healthcare in the country. What is there in the Ministry of Health is more politics. In fact, I'm shocked when you're saying this, and I'm expecting you to actually give the government Tell the minister that this is what is right. The CBA is here. We have a starting amount that need to improve. We need to have more doctors hired. And therefore, we need to put a plan to, have, to ensure that this is done. Because accordingly, level three facilities, level four, level uh, five, level six, need to have a particular number of doctors to offer the services that are expected. It is impossible to do that if there's no plan to employ. Even those who already graduated are still being discouraged by the necessary thing reduced by 91 percent. I must tell you, Trevor, where we are now, and the, the way the statement comes from the head of public service, they're just uh, schemes to, to, to make the board to say that things are working, yet there's no clear plan with the government to resolve this matter. So, Davji, Davji, even with the proposal from the government, you're not calling off this strike? No, the strike is on. I think it's on now more hundred fold than before, because it's a clear show that actually you're speaking about the government. It just means that the meetings we've had with them are academically criticized. And okay. the, reality, the directive that, the, is, that is written right here from the end of public service is not a negotiated discussion. It's a one side line, it's a one side point, which violates the collective bargaining agreement. It means there's no doctor in any institution in this country who is safe if the impunity could be perpetrated. Okay.
Thank you, Davji. Davji Atela, there came PDU Secretary General speaking to us, and I'll allow you to respond to what Davji is saying, that the strike is now on even more than ever because the, pro the proposal by the government is not a negotiated directive. Thank you. That is his perspective of uh, uh, the information that came from the head of public service. But let me just make a rejoinder that doctors are not potatoes or goats that you just produce in numbers within, without taking into perspective where they are trained in terms of availability of training equipment, human capital to be able to deploy, to, to be able to train them. So it's not just a question of numbers, and that is why you cannot be able to achieve that 50,000. Just by taking doctors today, if we are just aiming at the numbers, we could take them today and graduate them tomorrow. We shall have achieved the 50,000. But what is the impact on that on the health of the people? So that percent of quality of the training is something that we must discuss. We cannot sweep it under the carpet. And we know it is a problem, and you can be able to verify this with the regulatory agency in terms of the complaints that are coming out. We don't have a visibility in the training institutions, and that is a conversation that we must be able to have. Uh, it would also be uh, we should not be able to decide what the court is going to say tomorrow. This is a matter that is before court. Yeah. Uh, the court gave directives. Those court orders ought to be complied with. And when we go back to the court, we will not be discussing the CBA of 2017 in terms of the court orders. Yeah. To the best of my knowledge, the orders that were issued by the court were based on the current strike. They are not based on the order CB of 2017. Yeah, but the current strike is based on the 2017. Yes, yes, but the which orders was not honored, and it was but the orders, in orders given by the honourable judge are specific yeah. to the 19 issues. So why would these orders be obeyed if the first ones for the CB were not obeyed? What difference will it make? It's the same courts. The economic situation, of course, is different from when the CBA was signed. Sometimes you can be able to sign something under duress, eh? and then so saying this was for all intents duress. and purposes, when it comes to implementation, you cannot be able to. Circumstances beyond your control then make it impossible for you to be able to deliver on a commitment that you made. Okay. This happens even in reality, in our own lives. You committed, you took a debt from somebody, you committed to pay by debt X, debt X arrives, you don't have any money. Would you have you shot or you renegotiate? So, for a win-win situation for all of us. This is where the, the, the rubber meets the road, DG, because if you're saying that it depends on the economic situation and the courts will rule, what if that ruling of the court goes against what the government thinks? Will you then again say that this is not going to be possible? We will it's be able a, to honor a, the court, court rulings. Of law. We will but be the first one was not honored. We will so be able to honor. Be we will be able to honor the court of court rulings based on the judgment that was issued and the six orders that were issued. Yeah. The government has complied. Worst case orders. scenario, what happens? Because the people are looking for services, they are not receiving them. What, what is the stopgap measure by the government? We're heading into day 20, the clinical officers are in day two, the lab technicians are starting on Wednesday. We'll have to be able to go to the drawing board and see what next course of action we'll, we'll be able to take. You haven't? Let's wait until tomorrow, we'll be able to have a clear pathway. Okay. Let's see what the, what the viewers are saying here, Trevor Mbija at Citizen TV Kenya, and see what you're saying. The hashtag is, uh, is, is, is uh, the explainer. Let's bring up those questions and see. Sengeli Brand says, give the MOH budget limitations, uh, given the MOH budget limitations, are there any alternative solutions or compromises being considered to address the doctor's concerns? Are there any compromises? Yes. And what are they? that uh, we are open still for discussion despite even everything that we have put on the table. We are ready to call the union leadership for a hardness discussion so that we can be able to have a win-win situation so that the Kenyans don't suffer no more. Okay. Also, will lessons be learned from the doctors strike Kenya? Dr. DG Amoth, share strategies to prevent future disruptions and improve communication with healthcare professionals. Are we learning any lessons from this, Dr. Critical, and remember in my opening remarks when I talked of the perennial issues, this is the first time that we have been able to distill issues raised by the union and broken them into silos, what belongs to the national government, what belongs to the county government, what is concurrent.
and it, what is long standing that requires a long term process that will be able to address these matters once and for all. All right. Let's bring up more feedback and see what you're saying. Should, but just out of curiosity, should the government, should the courts even rule that this strike is illegal but the strike still continues? What is the next step? That is the question that most Kenyans are asking. But Okelo James says, why should it take the government over three weeks to respond to the grievances of doctors? Is the government of Kenya going to be held accountable for the lives that have been lost due to the delayed response? The response started immediately. The strike commenced. Discussions have been ongoing. We have gone to court. But the doctors, remember, also took an oath. And the oath we take is to be able to protect life. Will we, will we continue taking these intransigent positions while our brothers and sisters die? Or we search our conscience and go back and continue the discussions? OK. Let's bring up more feedback here. As we and a life lost is a life lost forever. Yeah. We'll never recover that life. And many people are laying that blame on the government's doorstep because you should be the bigger person to step back. Do you accept that responsibility? It's the government's role to offer health care to the people. And that is why we are saying we are open to discussion, we are open to negotiation, we are open to furthering this conversation to the highest level possible. The Honorable Judge was not, he must have been very, very brilliant to look at all these issues raised and realize that some of these issues cannot be at the doorstep of the Ministry of Health. We need to bring a bigger conversation. In fact, now I would even call it Hall of Nation, Hall of Society approach. So everybody must have a voice in this discussion. So you're calling for a national dialogue on this? So be it. Let's bring up some more feedback in there. We'll see what you're saying here as we finish up on this. Uh, you don't leave a name, but you say, Trevor, the 2023-2024 cohorts are to collect their internship letters. So my question is, why have the other cohorts been left out? The clinical officers are the ones who began collecting their letters last week. Mm -hmm. The 2023-2024 cohort, that is 37, 59 numbers, includes medical officers, yeah. pharmacists, Bachelor of Science Nursing, Clinical Officer Nursing, Bachelor of Science Clinical Officers. So it is the entire spectrum. Okay. Yeah. Clinical officers, uh, interns also want to be paid. Is that possible? It's one of their 10 demands. Yes. That is one of the demands that they are put. Yeah. And we have been paying clinical officer interns, both the diploma holders and the degree holders. Okay. And it is because of these numbers that I told you about that mm -hmm. Treasury said, no, you Ministry of Health, the figures that you have continued to churn year in, year out are not tenable. You need to be able to work out a sustainability framework to ensure that the internship program does not collapse or does not disrupt other pri priority government ac activities. Okay. All right, let's bring up some of the feedback here and the questions coming through. Ben Mark says, for how long shall the Ministry and Council of Governors open ears to listen to, for, to the cry of UHC contractual staff to put them on PNP, Permanent and Pensionable Employment? Trevor, that is a discussion that has taken place for a long time. When you have a contractual obligation with uh, a party, you sign to that contract. And if the contract says, I've, I've given you a contract for one year, you cannot force me at the end of that contract now to take take you in for another 10 years. Huh? So let's obey contractual obligations assigned. Mm. The government will be able to come with a policy if there's that demand and they see that the fiscal space will allow, then we'll be able to onboard them on P&P. &P. But for now, we have a contract that is binding to the two parties. And the contract was not P&P. &P. Okay. Yeah. Let's bring up one of the feedbacks again and as we close, Alfie says, why reduce the intern salary by 91%? The strike will not end if that's not corrected. Government knows that, but when I insist, unfortunately, the patient continues to suffer, and it is sad. The proposal from SRC now puts the intern salary at... Between 40 to 70,000. It's a 91% reduction based on the 2017 CBA, which was at 209,000. That... 
reduction. That was the opinion of Salaries and Remuneration Commission. Based on the letter that came from the Treasury, indicating that these numbers are not sustainable in the foreseeable future. Trevor, if you look at the numbers in the region, Rwanda pays the interns 500 US dollars equivalent. Uganda pays about 40,000 Kenya shillings equivalent. Tanzania pays around the same as about 40,000 Kenya shillings equivalent. I was told today in, that Nigeria pays equivalent of 19,000. So African countries are grappling with this together with the tight fiscal space, the implementation of budget framework 2023 with very, very limited uh, space for uh, to accommodate priorities. Then it was our belief that uh, let's ask for an opinion of SRC to see what will be sustainable in the foreseeable future. If we did not take that direction, what were we expected to do if we did not have the 206,000? Just sit back and not explore other possibilities. So that is one of the options on the table that is subject to. But all these countries you've mentioned don't have the same policy when it comes to posting interns by balloting. Here in Kenya, an intern who has been studying in Nairobi can ballot and be posted somewhere in Garissa, for example. Would it be fair to reduce their salary? And yet they are leaving the area of and going to start a life somewhere completely different. They are starting from zero, so there's nothing that they're losing the process. That would only obtain if you are moving an officer who has been in service from mm -hmm. one place to another, reducing their salary because they have been used to earning a particular sum of money. Interns are going to earn for the first time when they are deployed. Okay. Let's bring up more feedback and see what you're saying here as we wind up. And uh, Wayne says, Kericho declaration does not fall within the precincts of the law. SRC 2 has been emboldened by these pedestrian declarations. Declarations which fall out of labor law and are unprotected to CBAs must be frowned upon. Okay? So what else is saying? Ernest says the doctors or medics for that matter are highly educated. People who can sit and reason under any circumstance. Their job is actually a calling to work with whatever is available to save lives. Let them go to work as their representatives reason with the government until they come to an understanding. People should not die for lack of medical attention because the medics are on strike. Okay. Your final remarks to the people who are seeking medical services and they cannot get them. And it's a dire and desperate situation. First of all, I would like to thank the doctors and uh, other healthcare workers who have remained true to their calling, have continued to provide emergency services despite this ongoing industrial action. And I also call upon my colleagues that it is a high time. Kenyans have suffered enough. Let's come back, reason together, get a solution for this problem, and get permanent solution for the perennial industrial action that has bedeviled the health sector. Let's discuss, solve these things once and for all. Let's avoid the band aid treatment that we have previously prescribed for strikes that people go on strike, we dangle one or two, then the fundamental issues are not addressed. And I've mentioned the fundamental issues from the training, the quality, the numbers that we need, the budgetary allocation that we require going for, forward in tandem with our population, the norms and standards that we have in place, all of these things we can only be able to discuss in a peaceful environment, not during an industrial action. So I plead with Davi and team to be able to call our colleagues, come back to work, let's negotiate while we are delivering services to the people of Kenya. We took an oath, we swore to do no harm. Now what we are doing, we are causing harm. And any life lost is a life lost forever. We cannot be able to recover that life. I plead with you, please, colleagues, let's come back. All right. Thank you so much for making time for us. Dr. Patrick Amoth is the Director General, Ministry of Health. Tomorrow there's a court issue. They say they continue to discuss as well to see where this ends. All right. For now, we're taking a quick break with the explainer. We're back with much more.